Hey everybody, welcome back to Terminus, the Wasteland 2 of Extreme Metal Podcasts. I am the Death Metal Guy, a.k.a. Dark Peter Griffin. Ooh. <laughs> and I am the Black Metal Guy, a.k.a. Metal Archives Searching Hate Breed, Only to Despair. By the time you were 35, this has happened dozens of times. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Well, that's that's one of the reasons I was talking to you uh, earlier, because I guess the Acacia Strain just got added uh, as a result of their last album, which is kind of absurd because it's 90% metalheads that listen to the Acacia Strain anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. But wait, yeah, that's funny, because I just searched for them on Metal Archives and found it, and I assumed they'd always been there. That's interesting. No, no, that's a that's like a fresh edition with the new records. But uh, Just, I mean, how... How, how are they going to let so many things slide in all sorts of ways and then hold the line on metalcore? I I don't know. You know, it's it, I think we've talked about this on the show a little bit about how um, certain metalcore bands, especially some of the most important ones, like almost no one holds on to. Where it's uh, you know I talked about how when I was younger I always thought of Hatebreed as like the purest hardcore band. And it was only later in life that I realized, oh, no, they're really much more metallic. But I've also heard the same thing from hardcore people who call Hatebreed a metal band. So, I don't know. There's there's cultural distinctions there, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> um, in, in other news, uh, Black Metal Guy, I regret to inform you that this podcast is about to go way downhill from this episode on because I got my medical card yesterday. So that's that's probably going to become a substantial issue in the near future. Recording. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to have to uh, have to bring Hyper Shaman on board. Uh, yeah. Just yeah. Just um, bring him on to uh, we'll just, sort of we'll translate. To... <laughs> <laughs> the, um, man, your medical card. Let's, uh... Yeah. My my stoned grumblings. He can translate in his native you dialect. Need a medical card anymore. Like it's probably basically legal now, or does it just mean you get it cheaper? Well, it was it was interesting. So down here in Florida, it's still medical, but I was able to get my card, or at least my temp card, while it's in the mail, uh, within about a forty five minute process of like <laughs> seeing a doctor, paying my fee, paying the other fee to the board, and having the card issued, and then I took it to my local dispensary where they proceeded to not look at it or look me up at all. So I think they just sold it to me, <laughs> regardless. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it's been decriminalized for a long time, but we're still waiting for uh, full recreational legalization. But it, it doesn't seem like the barrier to entry is very high. Interesting. Well, um, well, I, 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 I'll enjoy, I'll enjoy this our final podcast together to the fullest. Well, it's not like I haven't been stoned for all the others anyway. But <laughs> and if, <laughs> and if you want to hear more stoned ramblings from me, the death metal guy, or probably not stoned ramblings from the black metal guy, feel free to follow us on social media. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook at Terminus Podcast, and you can follow my co-host on Instagram at Terminus Extreme Metal. And the best way to support us is with your credit card by signing up to us on Patreon, where $5 and up gets you access to all of our uh, Terminus Prime bonus episodes, as well as the Terminus Black Circle, our private Discord server, where today we were mostly discussing Forgotten 2000s alt-rock classics. You know, um, also, interesting thing, uh, we had some, uh, we had a huge bump in downloads this past week for no reason that I could imagine. Hmm. Uh, so maybe some new people found the show and downloaded a ton of it, which is cool. But then on the other hand, have you noticed that our YouTube numbers are just like dead? It's been very strange. Uh, I kind of wonder if it's just some sort of like weird counting interaction between. Like, uh, like the, I, it makes sense that the neo folk episode was like less popular, and hey, it's still done better than like say your average Terminus episode from two years ago, right? It's mm -hmm. got almost a hundred hundred views or whatever in a week, but um, the subscriber count is just totally static. 
think we we got one new one, but it's been like flatlined. You know, maybe you gain one, lose one, flatlined for a couple weeks. So, uh, you know, maybe Terminus is finally important enough that YouTube is throttling us. But uh, <laughs> you, you should you should check. Um, you know, uh, you do hear occasionally about channels where people get unsubscribed to the channel without doing it intentionally. So check if you're subscribed. And if you aren't subscribed and you have never subscribed... YouTube why? hates us because we speak the truth about liturgy. Hey all This is Brandon from Cromley, and you're listening to Terminus. All right, guys, we are up with our first record of the night, which was uh, one that was pretty exciting for me to bring on the show uh, because this, this is the uh, triumphant return of a band that's been gone for a long time now. Uh, this is the third and newest full length by Austere titled Corrosion of Hearts out on Lupus Lounge. Um, we've probably mentioned Austere a few times on the show over the years, but f for those of you who don't know, um, Austere is an Australian uh, DSBM band that had some level of notoriety back in the 2000s. Uh, their first record, Withering Illusions and Desolation, was released in 2007, and then the follow-up to Lay Like Old Ashes, where they really took off, was released in 2009. Um, and then they basically lied dormant, apart from you know some box set releases, uh, until Corrosion of Hearts here in 2023. Um, not sure exactly why there was so much delay. I would guess that part of it has to do with uh, this band's a duo and one of the main members who goes by the name Sorrow in this band um, is a relatively famous uh, multi-instrumentalist, uh, composer, pop song writer, uh, who's sort of an industry musician. So I'm guessing that took up a lot of his time. But... Uh, despite attaining that level of success, the guys stayed pretty active, still releasing extreme metal material between a bunch of different projects, and it's really good to have Austere back. Um, Black Metal Guy, I'm assuming that... I mean, did you hear any Austere back in the day when they were kind of popping off? I may have, like... I'm sure I did. I was not too interested in DSBM back then, although I think we've talked about how to a certain extent, everyone was interested in DSBM back then because a lot of the good projects or new things were sort of inflected by it one way or another. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like obviously, I did really like Life Lover, for instance. But, um, uh, and like, yeah, everyone encountered it to some degree, right? I had a Zaster CD. But the, uh, <laughs> we, we all have a Zaster CD somewhere in our car. <laughs> exactly, yes. Laying around. Yeah, yeah the, um, so I... I'm sure I did. Uh, I remember it being like sort of compared to, or I don't know, maybe uh, probably Austere was the first, but like, was there also like Grease, Gree, like Gray? Yeah. Uh, th yeah, they were like a Canadian band, I think. Right. So they're this wing of more kind of more ethereal heavily atmospheric DSBM type stuff. Um, it wasn't... I think because what I was looking for at the time was just things that were really metal, I probably just didn't gravitate towards it, right? Yeah. If, and, and we're about to, you know, I think a central theme for you for this review uh, is... Uh, something you've said in the notes is the connection between DSBM and what is now known as post-black... Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if people were, like, looking at an austere record and saying, oh, it sounds like post-rock, I probably would have been like, okay, well, I, I, I have post-rock. At, at, I have post-rock at home already. <laughs> um, you just sh show the cover of a, of a Mogwai CD or something. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, Young Team or whatever, right? So I, I probably ignore, like... Yeah, it was never something I was terribly interested in, but um, I really, this is a really cool record. I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, uh, which uh, I'm glad that you liked it, and it kind of uh, surprised me that you liked it so much because, and this is where we'll get into the topic of the relationship between Post Black and DSBM. Um, we've discussed this a few times on the show, but at this point I think I've refined the hot take into 
the vast majority of supposed post black metal is just rebranded DSBM with with certain aspects of post rock chord phrasing brought in but uh, fundamentally it's like 80% DSBM by volume so it's it was brighter friendlier chords usually yeah yeah you know so it's like you're supposed to be it's supposed to be like sad but kind of wistful rather than just sad and angry um so listening to the new austere i heard one of the singles that led off of this record and I liked it, but I was a little bit on the fence because I thought, I don't know, man, this is sounding like kind of post-black compared to the old stuff. So I went back and listened to Withering Illusions and Desolation. I was like, oh, no, it's 90% the same. It's just post-black has successfully rebranded rebranded DSBM to the point where we're like missing where these musical techniques actually come from. Um, after giving it a few listens, I can definitely say this is a DSBM record and this is the natural third record by Austere. Um, certain stuff has been polished up and punched up a little bit, but for the most part, this is rooted in 2000s DSBM tradition, which is exactly what I want from a band like this. Um, so getting into what makes austere distinct musically, um, this is definitely directly for, I mean, really 2007 when that, uh, that first record was released was almost like the nexus point year of, you know, internet DSBM exploding and, you know, sort of burning itself out very rapidly shortly after, um, what makes Austere interesting compared to a lot of the contemporaries, even though they're sharing a lot of the same basic musical technique, uh, a lot of simple repetitive song structures, and a lot of the same pacing, this tends to be like pretty slow music, really comes down to chord voicing and this unique harmonic sense that the band has. Um there's a lot of ways to write riffs that sound sad, like, you know, just primary color um, depressing, for lack of a better word. Austere doesn't do a lot of that. Uh, a lot of their chording tends to be a lot more sort of gray and wandering and confused. You know, it, it seems to tap into the the psychological aspects of depression that aren't so emotional. This is like remarkably unsentimental yes. music. It's, it's very exact. Yeah. It's very cold, which I yeah. appreciate. it is. It is very cold and desolate and it feels like wandering, you know, a, a forest where all the trees are stripped of their leaves, uh, which is interesting. Um, in fact, there's very little across this record that you could point out that sounds just one dimensionally sad. Um, and in terms of expanding the palette from their older work, uh, there's a couple new features. You know, you've got some some clean vocals here and there and some more elaborate layered instrumentation. But the bigger thing that they get really into are these. It's, it's difficult to describe, but very like powerfully sorrowful Dorian scale melodies mm -hmm. that are almost like, you know, the the saddest possible thing you would hear from like blind guardian or an old heavy metal band or something really, really exploring the sort of like sadness that lurks underneath a lot of these conventionally triumphant melodies. And those usually form the climax points of the various tracks on this album. It's just a, a four track record. They're all long songs, you know, standard DSBM stuff. Um, but they function as really nice capstones to the elaborate journeys that these songs are, especially as a, a big emotional release moment after what can be minutes on end of sort of like deliberately trudging, uh, emotionally neutral or maybe even just like emotionally blocked off stuff emotionally um, blocked off is a good phrase um and that could lead us to the first sample i think um, yeah sure i mean so when thinking about like how does this compare to post rock well or to sorry post black quote unquote um you know, uh, and when I think of post-black, I think of stuff that's, like, sad and melancholic, but also just sort of, like, nebulously blissful, like, hey, man, nature and shit, uh -huh. you know, like rainbows and, <laughs> right? you know, and not in a cool way, uh, I, uh, 
I, I once took a great photo of a rainbow over Loch Ness, right? But that was very clawfist. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, r- sort of like uh, pretty pastel landscape picture, blah, blah, blah. Um, and um, And a thing that I think characterizes post-black and one of the big problems with it has always been uh, the you know one thing that austere has in common with post-black is lots of arpeggios right and sort of like with a sort of more shimmering guitar tone and uh, that's kind of the the core of the music but post-black often presents the arpeggios as if they were riffs or rather, presents, takes, like, bare-bones arpeggios and tremolo picks them. Uh, tremolo picks out each note in this shitty arpeggio. And mm-hmm. the riff is, like, three of those. Uh, and it, it's... And that is sort of hanging in sonic space without a lot of support. Or to the extent that it's supported, everything is just kind of doubling it or playing the root notes. Um, sort of, uh it often sounds very forced like there's no um there's no real melodic or there's no real melodic movement that is forming the riffs it's just like this sort of like pushing things from okay one two three four okay hold that one for half the measure okay one two three you know um the Uh, The arpeggiated stuff in Austere is quite different from that. Um, And I I really, really like it. Uh, Crucially, these are plucked arpeggios, and they're quite intricately plucked, almost to the degree of folk finger picking. Um, And they work across... There's very rapid uh, weaving in and out, across relatively narrow intervals uh and the they have kind of, and the chords kind of um instead of like sort of sparkling and diffusing into the into the afternoon sun right these chords kind of pull in uh then and sort of curl over on themselves coil in and they sort of you can see someone like pulling up his coat against the wind. I like that. Well, I also like that you pointed out um, the narrow melodic intervals these guys use. Um, there's a lot of these arpeggios are are all clustered at a very narrow portion of the fretboard, which always makes them sound a little bit more tense and anxious than a lot of like standard DSBM or post black arrangements. That, yeah, 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 yeah. That's and and they have you know, although they are very epic. The, the, this is this is a really epic record. They they have you know, there's a fair amount of half steps and things like that. And they're working, yeah, like narrow area of the fretboard. You just, it's almost like they're finding all this movement like within one octave. Almost mm-hmm. you get like, um, the uh, um. And you you know yeah like like you have a couple pedal points in each chord which might be the root and the octave and the fifth, and then unlike more static arpeggio based music, there's a real melodic line that runs through the movement of chords, uh, and which you can trace with the shifting pedal points, uh, and it gets worked out through the the more chiming intervals between like the threes and sixes and flat sevens um uh but the mood there is like yeah pulling up the coat against the cold it's there's something that they pull they they're they tighten and pull inward but not in like an introspective way per se uh but in in a this kind of like uh the the erection and maintenance of a barrier so there's something uh self-preservative but also hostile about it um and bitter and i think the first title of the first track is fitting it is called sullen we're going to listen to three minutes of this and just uh pay attention to the arpeggio the basic arpeggio riff which doesn't change and all of the cool stuff it interacts with
actually like that riff a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, so that's the kind of, that's like a good example of something you could pick out of this and be like, that's a post-black riff. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And it has a lot of the things I usually, like, that's a riff that in another context I might hate. Yeah. Um, because it's just this kind of listless, sighing descent. But, um, and, and because another band might present something like that as epic, right? That sounds like Wolves, like, there are riffs all over Wolves in the Throne Room like that, where it's like, oh, Wolves in the Throne Room are getting lost, right? They're, they're yeah. on their way to a riff, they're lost again. <laughs> um, uh, and, um, this is, uh, however, here, it is prepared for by a whole bunch of stuff that is very cool, and here it's deliberately used to create this feeling of sinking denouement, right? Mm -hmm. Of things winding down, or of, you know, despair. And, and as you said, wandering, sort of a disorientation, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wow, I've been wandering in these woods for quite a while, and I've managed to avoid having any thoughts, but now I am... Don't know where I am. Oh no! Sad head voice came back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a big part of this is almost like trying not to have thoughts. Um, yeah, they, something is definitely getting teased out with the sort of like deliberately monotonous, sort of oceanic quality of it, mm-hmm. um, and that kind of comes down to the arrangement of these songs. You know the. Um, the clean guitar line that is through basically all of that opening three minutes isn't really used as like a riff. It's really used more like a loop, like in the sense that more like uh, electronic goth bands would use it. You know, it's um, a lot of the melodic content on this record is very deliberately sort of open and non-specific, which allows them to play with these melodic layers in a way that isn't traditionally heavy metal. Yeah, I, I hear that. It certainly it certainly only plays like a riff to those of us who really like brooding arpeggios. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you're right. It's not easy to... It's got an elusive thing about it. You can't really hum it. Um, and yeah, no, I think, I, think I, I take your point. It's like... It's it's basically dragged and dropped and works as a continuum over which a bunch of other stuff happens, right? Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like it's it's a loop. Um, that makes sense. Um, and as you said, there the texture is really important. So uh, the that loop works throughout with another level, which is a power chord riff that is at first just playing the root but then sort of goes into counterpoint with it uh and over the entire under the entire sort of chiming looping chord progression uh there are an a b there's an a and a b variation of that power chord riff Mm -hmm. um and it sort of like slides does this sort of syncopated slide step upwards Mm -hmm. that's that's like something you would hear on a life lovers record yeah Um, yeah that's a really nice touch yeah, it's kind of this just like a dejected, dejected goth punk ramalama. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then you get the first of those big leads, which you already highlighted, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're uh, they're very important to this whole record. <clears throat> yeah, and the big lead actually plays with melodic ideas that were already in the power chord riff. Something like that. I can't remember exactly. Mm-hmm. It, I can see how to you it could sound like a Blind Guardian riff. It also kind of sounds like a Rotting Christ riff. Oh, I could definitely see that. It, it's, it's definitely something that is like very connected with old school heavy metal in this kind of odd way. Old school heavy metal, but also kind of folky and pulsing. I got a, it's got like a hammer on feeling to it. Mm-hmm. Um, we're actually going to hear more riffs like that in the Hanging Garden record later. But um, uh, yeah, so so it's 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 a cool big lead, and there's no. Uh, in part, it works so well because there is not like a change of section, 
right? It, it's just all these parts have been designed to mesh over each other. So the riff keeps, the, the underlying loop keeps going with the power chords, and then you get this big lead over it. And, you know, the only thing that might change is sort of inflection and the drumming and the rhythms. Yeah. Uh, in, in essence, the primary influence of any sort any sort of post thing on this band is that structural conceit of this slow layering of additional melodic voices. Yeah, that's the, yeah, yeah, that, that's well said. And at, at the end, and then at the end, right, the epic, that kind of epic folky lead, heavy metal lead turns into that kind of crestfallen tremolo picked, uh, that crestfallen tremolo run. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, our our heavy metal riff turns into a post-black rifflet and sort of um, uh, subsides, which is pretty depressing. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is the point. Um, do you have anything more you want to say about the song structure, or can I talk a little bit more about influences? No, go for it. So, you already sort of mentioned, you already used the phrase, more electronic goth. And this is a, I mean, those sorts of arpeggios are the basic building block of this entire record, those arpeggio loops, and they are really derived from goth, and uh, an important thing to point out is that goth is a big direct influence, not just on DSBM, but at the very root of post-rock. Um, mm. So, uh... You remember, so years ago, the guy from Mogwai did a like list of his favorite records for the Quietus, and I remember being like, "God damn, this list is like good, and like you can learn something from it." There were big cool bands I'd never heard of, but very prominently was Fields of the Nephilim. Mm. And even though Mogwai's moods are very different, when you hear that's like you know, even though it's a lot more uh, sunlit and exuberant. When you hear those big echoing sort of uh, arpeggiated chords, it makes sense. Um, mm, okay. And uh, and then the Nephilim also painted on a really big canvas, uh, long songs. And we've also did a, done a bonus episode right on Forgotten Woods, where we talked about the Nephilim connection. Mm -hmm. Um. And so it's not an influence you hear very directly at all in the more mainline Scandinavian black metal, but it's really clear there. So um, I want to just play an example of, like, this arpeggiated guitar style really is the Nephilim thing, and I'm going to play an example of that. This is one of my favorite songs by them, Chord of Souls, from their self-titled The Nephilim in 88. And this is one where they are going on both full goth and full metal. <laughs> Oh, goth, cool, right? goth rock is actually cool. It's just like DSBM, but a little faster and weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's actually my my favorite thing I've heard from Nephilim so far. That I, also, I like they do a fake out thing, like at the beginning of the austere song we just played, where it's starting with that winding slow trem, and then when the drums kick in, they're like double time of where you expect them to be. Hey, that, that's that's a good point, and. Yeah, also the the riff changes inflection, right? At the beginning, it's da -da 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 mm -hmm. and then the drums, yeah, the drums come in also like a beat or a half beat away from where you think, and the riff 
although almost the same, slightly changes shape. Mm -hmm. It's like you hear the basic... It's like you hear the melodic, the, the general... It's like you hear the melodic form, or like the... It's like you hear the essence of the riff, and then when the drums kick in, it gets like its specificity to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool, <coughs> and you could also hear the... Um, although there's a lot less detailed rhythm work, uh, like power chord work under it, you could hear that there were some very important, prominently placed power chords that were... Yeah. Uh, filling in under that but but it's also a goth band so the bass is the primary riffing instrument totally yeah the, the yeah the bass and the, the the guitar loop and you know um you could hear how that guitar loop could be translated without any change into like a trance synth line yeah yeah i can definitely right. it, it all yeah. it all fits together yeah, no, man. If you like that track, you'll just generally like the Neff because it, this is more like a good album cut. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, like there's a lot more where this came from, uh, and uh, at their best, they really do sound like like sort of ghost Motorhead. Well, yeah, it really just like if you just don't think about it as goth or those preconceived notions, this really just sounds like a weird heavy metal band. Yeah, it's sort of like a heavy metal band sort of accidentally stumbling into... Well, not ac It's like a, a heavy metal band basically figuring out the second wave black metal formula before second wave black metal. Yeah, yeah. No, you're definitely right. Yeah, Because we've talked a little bit about how those goth rock markers are all over plenty of the second wave records. Yeah, and just the essential idea of, wait, we could have a harsh, off-putting vocal... Uh, sort of hot droning repetitive guitar stuff and the guitar could be sort of crystalline and textured instead of just battering but the music could still be fast and powerful and it could have like very serious occult charge to the lyrics mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know people saw goths everyone in the 80s saw those guys as like goofy weirdos but in a black metal context it, they'd be right at home yeah. All right, cool. So, um, let's go to uh, the other thing that I sampled, which is just... Um, so, that one was focused more on the arpeggios. This one's going to be focused more on the leads, although I think the riff is originally played in the sliding power chords. Uh, um, I'll just, you know... Uh, I'll just... We're going to listen to it for a while. I'm just going to start it off here. This is sort of in the midpoint of the song. Uh, I, I like the riff.
Yeah, <laughs> it's really that's, cool. Uh, <laughs> that, that is, uh, yeah, that's that's glorious. Um, and when I heard this, I was like, when that came riff came in, I was like, holy shit, this record is awesome, and I just <laughs> it really loud, and. The confidence this band shows. They know how good it is. They know they don't need to do anything to it. That's the second time the riff comes in in the song. And each, I think each time it comes back, they play it more times. <laughs> um, it's, uh... I, and I think you're going to sample picking up right from there, basically, right? Yeah, yeah. But... And the crazy thing is, I believe they introduce at least one other massive melodic idea before the song's over, right? Oh yeah, that comes in on my sample. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So th this is just this song is like twelve minutes long, but it 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 feels like it could be like forty minutes long if it wanted to be. And there's just really just cool commitment to to the idea. Uh, and in, in terms of just making the song around a couple sprawling, uh, sprawling riffs, um, and in the way the riff is played, this really reminds me of Blazeberth Hall. Yeah, I can definitely see that, and I think a lot of the um, a lot of the Australian stuff in particular in DSBM seems to have a little bit of kinship to that. They really like that clanging swirling thing mm -hmm. you know not to be confused with sort of like the the pleasant haze of post black they they want it to be like loud and ringing um i mean because you can you kind of get that from something like carved cross where you know yeah the the super lo-fi quality and the blown out reverb you know just creates overtones that play off the rest of the music yeah, you're definitely getting a more understated version of the Carved Cross thing here. And you're right, I love the guitar tone, and I love the embrace of the clang. Yeah. Uh, the clang and the drone, which is Blazeberth Hall and also kind of gothy. But, oh, yeah. Um, it, but, 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 yeah, there's a... These aren't exactly harsh guitars, but they certainly clang, and they certainly... Uh, you know, what's the other good word? I don't know. <laughs> they do that shit. Well, this um, this whole record really commits to itself aesthetically. I was thinking of where to bring this up, but the cover art is so like on the nose in an awesome way. It's just like yeah, dude. it's dead trees, and there's a bunch of ravens in the air, and the trees are covered in barbed wire, and one of the and one of the trees is turning into a hand that is holding like an anatomical drawing style human heart. It's like, fuck and, yeah, we're back in 2007, dude. <laughs> and, and as the wind is tearing apart the human heart, it is it's, it looks like the heart is turning into crows, which are being driven on the wind. That's so great. That's, a, it, that's the art a DSPM record should have. No, it is a beautiful cover, and I was thinking, I think I want to buy this just so I can own that cover. That is super fucking cool. Um, but I'm also glad that you, you took this sample, and we can have two samples that abut each other, because it's important to know the the scale that this band operates on they are as you said very epic just in a way that people don't associate with it that you know they, they think of you know dragons and shit which are epic but we're talking about a different thing here you know this is this is more like a, a tragedy that's epic in its scope you know it, it, and it's good you know because like when you're depressed it feels very all-consuming it feels very universal so um, I do like a lot of DSBM that is sort of this like grumbling internal thing, but I also like this where it's more, it fits more with heavy metal as a whole. Yeah, there's there's a kind of depression where every day feels like the last battle, right? Or the yeah. day before the last battle, and you're just constantly gritting your teeth uh, and at maximum tension. Uh, and th this is a lot like that. I also want to say something real quick about the riff, which is the specifically BBH aspect of it, um, or Slavic black metal in general, which is the um, uh, the way that the timing, it, it never follows conventional timing. Mm -hmm. The places where you think the note are, is going to change is not the place where it's going to change. The shifts happen earlier and later than you would expect, and in a really organic way that is... 
it's not charted out that you know that riff was not like dragged and dropped on guitar pro right mm-hmm. somebody played that with deep feeling and kept mutating it until it became something really unique and it, 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 even the way it sort of like briefly pauses or touches down in the middle and then springs off a second time mm-hmm. and like wraps itself down and then even as it winds down it throws in another flourish to loop it around mm-hmm. it's there's so much detail in it and it's um i don't know it's like some of the most vast riffs that like forest would do right where the riff just goes on for like you know 12 bars or um the uh and also in terms of the clanging tone and the you you sort of described also a simpler lead that was in earlier than that mm-hmm. and it came in before that it's having an air raid siren quality yeah the sort of strobing it, when it's arpeggiated it clangs and then when it's a lead it kind of strobes and trumpets mm-hmm and I feel like that that guitar tone and those intervals also remind me a lot of the most epic consonant hate forest riffs. Mm, sort of yeah, I can see that. And they sprawl, and there's like a lot of boom, 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 boom. You know? Yeah. Um, so but yeah, yeah. But it's the Slav, the Australian to Slav black thing. You can hear it in fucking um, uh, certainly in Drown in the Light, and you can also really hear it in the. Uh, um, is this is what's the, the suicidal emotions band? Obisicate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's continue from where the black metal guy left off, and we're gonna get more of the same riff and some subtle variations of it before it explodes into one of the climactic Dorian moments on the record, and you get to see the band really open up and add the tone color that you've been waiting for mm. for the entire song, and it's really huge when it finally happens. Oh, dude, that 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 capstone riff there is just so fucking good. That, that it's like, and and there's usually a moment like that on each of these songs where it slips into this much more vast uh, Dorian black metal scale territory, and that's what makes DSBM great. Is that 
good DSBM fundamentally remembers that it's black metal. It's supposed to be depressive and negative, but it's also supposed to be scornful and prideful, you know? And Austere maintains that just in those moments of, like, tremendous internal power without ever seeming like it's, like, it's not, it's not hopeful, you know, it's not, um, oh, this has a happy ending, but it's like willful in its certainty. And I really like that. Yeah, the song is not about being invincible. The song is invincible. Yeah, yeah, that's there, there, really there's good. A, there's a spiritual invincibility to this, the, to the character pulling up his coat. He, 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 may, he may go to his doom, or may, he may already have lost everything, right? But he's... There, there is, there is something unconquerable there, and the song, the song is that. Yeah, he's he's at the bottom, but that means he knows exactly where he is, and yeah, he can yeah, he yeah. can and he can orient from there. Because after all this sort of like wandering, discombobulated passages that make up these songs, then there's a moment of focus about uh, finally understanding the territory, and that's really cool. I like that. Yeah, that's that's a fucking uh, th- that song just. It, it it's totally unstoppable. It just keeps getting cooler. Even the build up riff to that riff. Yeah. For a minute, I thought, wait, is the riff he wanted to highlight this one, the first one that came in, because it was, it, you know, that sort of like aching. It sort of like slides back and forth. It's kind of a lilting romantic mood mm-hmm. to it. It's more textured, kind of droodky. Yeah. A lot of longing there, and. You know, it's like, oh, is that the riff you wanted to highlight? Like, because that one's great too. Oh no, it's the build up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like they, and it's interesting the the orientation there, where you know you've got sort of a peak moment with your sample, and then it pulls back, becomes much more minimal before exploding into the most maximalist part of the whole song. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I really like the sort of push and pull there. Um, so I don't have a ton else to say about this record apart from that it's extremely good and dsbm doubters should try it out um but i want to listen to a little snippet off the last track called pale which is probably my favorite song on the record actually but this is the one that really brings it back to 2007 if you guys weren't reassured by any of the other content listen to pale and you'll know oh yeah i know that it's been 14 years doesn't matter this is austere
I hate my life, I hate the world, I hate myself, but I like the riff.
right, and we are back from talking about uh, Bone Tomahawk and the movies of Zoller to discuss Hanging Garden with The Garden. Uh, this is uh, their follow-up to 2021's Skeleton Lake, which was a brilliant record that ended up on Terminus year-end lists. Um, Hanging Garden releases a new record every two years, pretty much like clockwork since the beginning. Uh, it's, a, it's an immensely productive band of people who are just really interested in songwriting. Um, and uh, it's had a semi-stable lineup for a while, and a very large lineup. Uh, the, um, yeah, a lot, a lot of members are, have been in since 2009 or 2004, right? Or the core, yeah, there's one member since 2004. So it's, um, uh, Hanging Garden is Finnish, um, and, uh, what else is there to say about it? Well, uh, I think we described their last record as sort of a more, a more folky catatonia. Yeah. Uh, and, and they, they really, the band liked that description. And I think it's a fair thing to say about, uh, a lot of the record, a, a, a lot of their, their earlier stuff. I, I really love their record. I am become from 2017. Um, and the important thing is that although it has the, uh, the emotive gothic sensibility you get with something like Catatonia, it also has the uh, warts and all aspects of that band. So it also just sounds really like crushing death doom a lot of mm -hmm. the time. And Skeleton Lake also had some moments of really heavy death doom, right? Yeah, yeah. It's um, um it, Skeleton Lake was interesting. Uh, it's it's such a a, a mass of different influences. All which collected together sounds like a bad idea, but is executed flawlessly. Yeah, it's such a wild record. Um, they're, uh, it's sort of, um, another thing you could say about the mood of the band is that they write about, pretty much all their records are about things just like death and the passage of time. Mm -hmm. Sort of like primary subject matter for doom. And yet the music and the way these themes are treated lyrically is always sort of um, uplifting and yeah. sort of really puts one back in the world in a really, I think, a really touching and valuable way. Um, so uh, the lyrics to this record are uh, great and worth talking about at some point, but... Um, yeah, so musically, yeah, the, the thing that was weird about the last record, musically, we could... Let's get into that a bit. So, uh, Skeleton Lake, right, you, like you said, it sounded like a bad idea on paper, but it was great, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the way I tried to describe it now, I can't remember how we did back then, but like something like... It's... They're short songs stitched together with the maneuvers and techniques of pop songs, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and and they're executed just bam, bam, bam. There's very little, like, riffs don't repeat for very long. Each section very quickly gives way to a new one. And it showcases just a ton of, like, clever transitions, huge key changes, uh, you know, uh, unexpected hooks, hooks everywhere. Right. Yeah, <laughs> and it's sort of pop metal writing being done with the with the riffiness of something like a thrash metal song, because mm -hmm. it's like every single part has to count, right? Instead of every, it, it not a lot of it isn't focused on the riff per se, but everything works like a riff. Every every single detail is cool and memorable, uh, and it moves at the tempo, and these pop things happen at the sort of uh, ADHD tempo you'd expect from like a tech thrash band. Yeah, it's it's really important to, I, and I don't mean it's literally at that tempo. It's all stately mid tempo or slow, but like, yeah, just the, in terms of numbers of repetitions of ideas. 
Yeah, yeah. and pacing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it, it's it's very important to draw attention to how short Hanging Garden songs are. Because um, that that really is kind of a quality of this band unto itself. In that there's, there's ways you can imagine a lot of these songs going on and being, you know, six, seven minute Peaceville pseudo epics. But they're not. They're usually done in three to four minutes, which is a very unusual format to hear this kind of pacing and these kinds of melodic ideas explored in. Um, since like you were saying, it is such a stately mid tempo, you imagine that the songs are longer than they are. And that's sort of a daring risk to take, to do something so slow that also doesn't give itself the time to sort of just naturally accumulate weight in the Mm -hmm. manner of like a regular Mm -hmm. doom band. I mean, if you were going to call hanging garden as belonging to a parent genre, it would probably be doom metal, but only in the sense of like later Peaceville stuff that has substantially crossed over with goth rock, with folk, with, you know, trad heavy metal, with alt rock, all these sorts of things. Yeah, I think, like, I Am Become probably sounds more overtly Peaceville-y and more, mm-hmm. sort of more death doomy and uh, has somewhat longer songs than these last two ones. But, uh, but yeah, exactly. That's where it's coming from, and now it's 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 developing all these every every affinity or association that that music had that Gothic Doom Death had is being fully explored and is like now at this point much more. Now at this point, all of those branches off from Catatonia and My Dying Bride are maybe more central to the music than the original influences. Yeah, yeah, it's it's very interesting, and well, let's let's bring that to the the newest album then, yes. which is kind of a pivot. I mean, it's like it makes sense within the context of what I've heard previously with Hanging Garden, but this is the one that I would say is like very openly and directly a pop metal record. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. I wasn't sure, you know, sometimes when you do that, all right, I'm like, okay, is he, you know, mm, I hear this as doing some other very serious thing, but I think you're right. Uh, Oh, it can still, it's still very serious, but it is like, they are made like pop songs. Yes. And, and the seriousness happens in a kind of, uh, yes, in, in roundabout unexpected ways. And yes, I think you're absolutely right. These are structured basically completely like pop metal songs in part because they uh they're not they have the things maybe this would also be the place to bring up what um our our patron Matt uh said on the Discord. Oh uh, yeah, sure. Because it's sort of relevant, right? We like he got really into Hanging Garden, really liked the last record, but he told us he didn't like. He thought we wouldn't like this, and that it, uh, and that you know it is some good tracks at first, but then it kind of just like wanders off and gets boring after a few, and uh, and you know that that we we wouldn't like it as much. Well, Matt, we do like it, um, and we're here to convince you why you should like it, um, <laughs> but. In fairness, right, he he was listening to it with a uh, intense and critical ear, right? And the things he heard, presumably what he heard was that this works in a very different way from Skeleton Lake, right? Yes. Where, where Skeleton Lake was extremely, if not riff-based, extremely riffy. Mm-hmm. This, most of these songs depend on the things that many of us find infuriating about pop metal. Mm-hmm. Which is that it is not riff based. Yeah, this is this is vocal led to a large degree. Guitars primarily outlining chord progressions, and when there are riffs, it's more just to add some color or texture in a section, and they very rarely take center stage. Yeah, yeah. However, they stick the landing on it kind of brilliantly, which I find so mm-hmm. interesting because I've got this like theory about hanging garden, especially after hearing this one in that I think these are <clears throat> a lot of the times you get pop metal and a lot of pop metal is made by guys who appear to have a very surface level understanding 
of heavy metal itself. Mm -hmm. Um, you, You know, guys that seem like they're coming more from the pop side. Hanging Garden feels like a band of like really serious extreme metal people who have mm-hmm. done a bunch of time and are coming back into more pop focused music but with but very highly informed by everything they learned in more complex extreme metal does that make any sense yeah, absolutely i think that's a great way of describing it and i think the main interest in pop is in some ways right the last record i think they almost see it as a challenge the last record had this like sort of sprightly look what we can do quality to it yeah yeah right look how (laughs) fucking catchy all of this is yeah we just did that (laughs) right and it it almost left you 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 know you were like if there's any problem with this record it's just that i want to hear more of these riffs right yeah yeah i thought like i there were certain moments on skeleton lake where i thought the the brevity was almost a liability it was like not giving the songs enough time i mean now i now i really appreciate it for just how compact it is but it's definitely weird to listen to from the perspective of someone who listens to extreme metal primarily for, for sure. No, I think it's absolutely right, though, that they are extreme metal people moving, deliberately working with pop as a method in a mm-hmm. kind of, uh, yeah, in, for, for their own artistic reasons. And um, it's, uh, you know, it, with something like this, right, I think I mentioned it with the last one, we've mentioned, you know, the usual goth, gothic death doom bands or whatever, but with something like this, uh, even on this record, you're always just two degrees of separation from skepticism. That is true. And in yeah. fact, this record may, in a roundabout way, have more to do with skepticism, uh, with the sort of scale and atmospheres. But we'll get to that later. So I think that's just Finnish depression seeping in. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, yeah, so I can get pretty quickly into samples here because I want to... So the thing that I find so cool about this, and this sort of dovetails with my idea about these guys being serious extreme metal guys because the prevailing so peaceville stuff among several other things was sort of the prevailing influence on skeleton lake here on the garden the prevailing influence is probably stuff that we discounted completely in the 2000s within the pop metal sphere Um, because one of the things that i would compare this most distinctly to would be the first handful of lacuna coil records back in the 2000s um, which are which have aged weirdly, certainly, but are well constructed pop albums. Um, so I think that something that's happening on this album is that Hanging Garden are um, revisiting some of this. You know, some people might call it guilty pleasure music from the two thousands. You know, from a lot of our high school days. You know, in our age bracket, listening. But I think they're going back to it. They're they're listening to it and they're taking it very seriously. Um, in terms of like the way it's constructed musically. So they're taking some of these hyper accessible ideas and seeing how do we make something that's more like high art out of this? And they really succeed. So I want to go to a track called The Nightfall, which I really love. This is one of my favorite songs on the album. Um, and you're going to hear some really interesting things. Let's let's keep in mind this idea of metal guys working with the pop form. So I'll give away one of the secrets. The very opening melody on this song is basically a magla melody that has been recontextualized into a pop format. Um, and as the song progresses, you're going to hear more and more of these notes of extreme metal bands coming through in melodic terms, but streamlined and distilled into this pop essence. And the result of it is just something that's immediately familiar to you as an extreme metal listener, but also alien because of the way that it's presented. And it's a really fun reframing of all those ideas.
so I, I was incorrect. It's actually that whole song that's McGlaw melodies, basically. And as you pointed out while we were listening to it, it's specifically the album closer uh, McGlaw songs, you know, with Hearts Toward None 7, uh, Exercises in Futility 6, stuff like that. Yeah. They're wrap up ones where they have these just immense, powerful riffs that they're just holding on to, waiting for the end of the album to unleash. Um, but what Hanging Garden does is they take that, strip it down, make it simpler. And then execute it with the sort of um, the idioms of pop metal from the 2000s. Uh, the big keening lead lines remind me of like, I thought it was early originally. It's more like mid era, my dying bride around like the dreadful hours, mm-hmm. um, as well as these sort of pop death doom bands that hanging garden gets associated with a lot like uh, November's doom, swallow the sun, stuff like that. And then in that chorus, you draconian. Which I think is a good comparison. Yeah, Draconia, but I'm just not that familiar with them, but I assume that this probably sounds a lot like Draconian. I, I, I'm, I'm taking a shot in the dark, but I'm comfortable with it. <laughs> no, I, I've listened to it. It's, it's actually, it's quite good. It's just like, I mean, it, it, Draconian is actually pretty death metal but it is it has very accessible direct melodies. I gotcha, yeah. Um, and then toward the end, we get into the, the chorus sequence where we erupt in into that huge uh, new metal rhythmic structure that that slowed down triplet on the kick drum ending in you know the giant snare hit yeah yeah that and that's that's a corn thing you would hear that you know on the sort of pseudo breakdown parts you'd hear on issues songs like somebody someone um, so basically this whole record is a pastiche of all these uh, forgotten techniques from the 2000s and oftentimes sort of the corniest ones, the ones that we think are the most dated. And then they recontextualize them and make them fucking sing in a way that they haven't since 2004. Um, it's just, it's so cool. I love the idea of the, like, it, and again, like Skeleton Lake, it's such a grotesque idea of like, what if we take a... Uh, modern kind of gothy black metal and insert those into 2004 new metal song structures but no i promise you it's gonna be great it's it sounds insane but it works <laughs> dude the heaviness of that part with the the, the sort of the pulsed breakdowny riff mm-hmm. um one thing is it, it has this sort of uh um it's really powerful because it has this rhythmic cross hatching to it. So on the one hand, you've got the boom, dum 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 dum, yeah, right. And on the other hand, you've got the guitar still tremolent, tremain on. I think in triplets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you don't just a de- you know, you don't end up in the lumbering shugga shugga of like a late Sepultura riff. Right? Yeah, yeah. It, it never sounds a, a problem with those riffs on some of those you know new metal bands is that they they tell you they're heavy, but they're actually pretty just like sterile. Um, and and on this, um, the there's just extreme straining ten- there's just I- extreme tension there uh it, it's very cool and it's very cool hearing a riff like that being played half time i mean it also just and when you do if you take a migla riff and half time it it also just sounds kind of like any number of droning heathen black metal bands yeah yeah i mean that's that's the the cool thing that we talk about with migla is like He's got that unique guitar style that can be scanned as 20 different things based on what you're used to, you know, and that's how you know it's like it's generative is yeah. because it's so immediately familiar and yet it's so distinct. Um, so, I mean, like right here, we're hearing a completely different recontextualization of those ideas. There's always been a uh, in Hanging Garden, there's always in the background. I think we talked touched on this last time. There's always a, a hint of Bathorian Bathorian chest thumping bombast, um, yeah. And on moments like that, you get it on moments like that, and you get it also more so like the track of the journey is pretty cool, and in many ways sounds like a uh, sort of swaggering Bathory adventure song. 
Oh yeah, well I think I think in general you can say with Hanging Garden that black metal is just all over the DNA. Uh, it, it's very rare that they'll play like a distinct black metal riff. Um, yeah. Like the intro to this song, notwithstanding, that's just a black metal riff. Yeah, this is the first time. Yeah. But it, it, it's it's so clear that that influence laces everything they do, uh, especially like you're saying, probably late Bathory, like his Viking era, probably. Um, uh, probably just like second wave classics in a lot of places and you know and the sort of intersection that we saw probably primordial i mean primordial is probably central mm-hmm. of these guys also oh that's that's a, that's a very good point actually yeah yeah well that that sort of mm-hmm. yeah i mean that 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 could be a, on a primordial record for sure yeah so uh let me go to another one um it's a it's a track called The Fireside. It's sort of the second to last like big hit single before the the song before the record wraps itself up. Um and this is definitely me just playing I like the riff. And I wrote in the notes the only thing I wrote was this is the centerpiece of my theoretical Queen of the Damned 2 soundtrack. And I kind of want to say that it's like Listening to this album, it's weird to have affection for this reason, but it really reminds me of stuff like listening to the new metal soundtracks of major action movies in the 2000s. And if you talk to people around our age, you'll run into a surprising number of people who their early metal experiences, for lack of a better term, were at least in a large part informed by, like, getting the Matrix soundtrack on CD or the Queen of the Damned soundtrack or the Little Nicky one. There were there were a bunch of these movies that had these sort of new metal and goth-oriented soundtracks that became mass sellers for cheap at Walmart, and that's how a lot of people learned about a lot of new bands. Ah, stand alone. <laughs> <laughs> Inside me, I'm not <laughs> oh man, dude! Do you have any idea how? I, dude, I saw th- that movie in theaters. It was sick. Oh yeah, dude. Oh, Scorpion King. Yeah, yeah. The Rock just kicked a bunch. I, of I, but look, look at the power of that. We immediately so Godsmack's "I Stand Alone." We've all heard it a billion times in a billion different contexts, but we say it's the Scorpion King song. Because we've made that that connection culturally. Mm-hmm. It's become that significant. So just like weird shit happens, like Disposable Teens, I think, is the one that's on uh, the Matrix soundtrack by Marilyn Manson. Well, actually, let me look that up before I make an ass of myself. There's a, there's one uh, Marilyn Manson track on it. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's Rock is Dead is on that one. It, it, you know, Deftones is on that. Monster Magnet's on that. The Prodigy's on it. This this whole nexus. Um, so Queen of the Damned 2, when that soundtrack comes out, I hope that The Fireside by Hanging Garden is the opening track. Oh, 
that that feeling when no cute 2002 goth chick to dance with to the fireside <laughs> it dude is but talk about just like a run of musical moments that all play off each other perfectly uh it, within this sort of pop metal context and Another one that I want to bring up that's very important to this song as well as others on the record is the overwhelming significance of typo negative to this band. Oh, that keyboard thing. Oh, yeah. So the the keyboard, the execution of the clean male vocals, this is really reflective of typo negative at their poppiest on records like Life is Killing Me. Mm -hmm. Um Like, think of some of the most accessible songs off that record, like Anesthesia, and you, you immediately get the relationship here Um, because that was the cool thing about typo negative was that they were simultaneously a dedicated goth rock band, a dedicated heavy metal band and a dedicated pop band. Mm -hmm. They were 100% all three of those things, which is why their music is so dynamic and unique and impossible to replicate by anyone else. The only way you get to it is by being similarly free with your influences like hanging garden are. And then, when you do that, when you're open to that whole possibility space, you can get songs like this, which execute on the pop metal idea to a degree that like almost nobody else has done. Yeah, I, I, I suddenly that makes a lot of sense. This is like sort of more um, typo must have been pretty important to Hanging Garden all, all along, especially the way the songs sort of metamorphose in kind of uh, often sort of funny and cool ways. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's like it, it's they're having a lot of fun playing it. Yeah, you got to mention those those keyboard parts. That there was one on your last sample too. Mm, yeah, they, yeah. They do a cool thing where the key, when the keys come in, they're essentially doubling a melody that's already there in the riff or the vocal, mm-hmm. but they um. But they exaggerate various parts of it and add new notes. They really take advantage of the wee woo of the you know the range on the keyboard and the ability to bend notes like that. So uh, whenever those come in, they're uh, it would be easy to just double the riff, but they don't do that. They actually add a new riff that is even cooler and also just so indulgent. It's hilarious. Hang, hanging Garden. I, I I think that maybe the conceit for. I think maybe the conceit for Hanging Garden is, like, we've got X amount of space to work with, like, standard rock or pop song length. And the other rule is something needs to be changing or happening every four bars. Like, something something new needs to be introduced, the oh, yeah. rhythm has to be changed. It's like, these are, like, hard constraints on the music. Like, they, they're forcing themselves to just write the big riff over and over again. And sometimes it's not even a riff, you know? <laughs> Dude, that, uh, yeah, also that uh, honors, too, as heavy, heaviest part on the record. Although, maybe the, the sort of the slow migla part on the last one is also very heavy, but the... Oh yeah. Um, apart, uh, those chords there are very like emo, and there are mm-hmm. parts throughout the record. Like this band has some sort of post-hardcore vibe, hiding. Like not not in a bad way. It's it's there. Like they they aren't just embedded in the metal scene. Uh, I think there's like like Cult of Luna and stuff here. Uh, and it wasn't as much apparent on the last one, probably more apparent on uh, I Am Become, but there are moments here that are just like, you know, where you get real emo cording or vocal delivery that uh, would not, that really converges really well with the Catatonia stuff, but it's not yeah. from the same place. I-, I think another place that some of this is coming from is the first few records by Nightwish way back in the day. Mm. Because we Nightwish is a band that's like basically just completely forgotten by extreme metal people for good reason, essentially. But the first handful of Nightwish records are really good. And you also got to remember that they came out earlier than you think. The first Nightwish record, Angels Fall First, comes out in 97. So it's like 
not far off the heels of Peaceville Doom in its prime. And oh, that's interesting. And all old Nightwish I always felt had this sort of like subtle gothy quality to it mm. in the way that it was executed cuz it's like, you know, it's symphonic power metal, but it always had this streak of sort of like lustrous Victorian darkness to it, at least for the first few records. So they're they've definitely they're dated naturally, but I think there's still a lot of good to dig out of those first few albums. Interesting, interesting. Perhaps in a moment of weakness, I will. Uh, I will, I will uh, I'll check it out. Yeah, yeah. The um, uh, tempting. Um, the uh, so uh, let us now go to my samples. So, just to give it away, the death metal guy chose the exciting songs. I'm choosing the boring ones. <laughs> uh, that doesn't mean they're bad. Uh, but like trying to, I, I mean, a big part of how I went into this was like, okay, why did our listener think this record wasn't as good as the last one? And, and what would strike a metal head as, uh, awkward or not, not as cool about it. Right. So, um, basically I, I suggested it before, but like, whereas the last one deliberately embraced everything that's most exciting about pop writing this record often takes the uh non riff based chord progression based production heavy structure of pop metal songs and uses that to create music that just has really intense continuity of mood or continuity of texture also i mean th there's always a pretty continuous mood on these records but c continuous more atmospheric textural music um so it's almost like they are if on the last one they were leaning into certain pop angles that they could give a really metallic aggressive inflection to in a certain way on this record they're using aspects of pop metal that are conducive to something much more like traditional doom songwriting with mm, yeah. really drawn out phrasing long extended passages and the song is blurred together because they're supposed to. Uh, and, and this is where the sort of the, the funeral doom thing is, is always hanging out in the back. Uh, mm, yeah. So like, um, and, and with a band like this, you just always have to assume they know what they're doing, right? It's like Fenner is saying, now I'm listening to the boring thrash. <laughs> um, like he's, he's after something there, right? You just have to figure out what it is. Uh, and, uh, so I tried to figure out, okay, where did our listener sort of decide this record had lost the plot? And my guess is going to be, well, the first three tracks are probably some of the closest to the last Hanging Garden record. They're very engaging. Four Winds is a great riff. Lovely lyrics, A Prayer to the Winds. Um, uh, the first three are very engaging. And then yours, right? Yours, The Nightfall, starts mm -hmm. the second half of the that was your first sample starts the second half of the record which is a bit more active mm -hmm. uh and has also the fireside both of these just very kind of exub exuberant action-packed songs so i think probably where it seemed like the and i'm sure if he'd made it to nightfall he would have perked up again right unless he had already sort of fallen asleep by that point so I think what is probably going to be the obstacle here are tracks like the song of spring and the fire at first dawn which are much more kind of uh, sprawling and gauzy. Uh, and um, let, let's listen to this and see if we can figure out what's going on here. <laughs>
So when we drop back into the verse, it almost has a kind of like lounge or trip hop inflection. Right? Yeah, I think that uh, I think I was talking about this on our last review. I haven't listened to that in a while. I'd have to go back. But a uh, uh, Rika Hataka, which I assume I'm butchering because Finnish names are impossible. Um, she is well. One, she's an outstanding vocalist. She was amazing on Skeleton Lake, and she is here too. But I think that I commented on the last record that. She doesn't do like female metal vocals, you know. She uh, there's always been this sort of like strange R and B inflection to some of her delivery and some of the way she times lines out, and that really comes out on this track. Interesting. Yeah, no, that that makes sense. And yeah, also just in touch with like female goth vocals and mm -hmm. pop vocals and things. Uh, um. Yes, not doing operat, not doing Nightwish. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not it never operatic female vocals. Blah blah blah. Right. Um, and that's one of the strengths. Um, but yeah, so that part is good, and the second time it repeats, it has a bit more presence. Uh, but I think the thing that could easily, the main riff there is designed to sort of lull you into. It sounds boring. It's designed to, it sounds tired and sort of like, uh, um, it sounds sleepy, not necessarily in a negative way, but drowsy. Uh, and, and the song is about, you know, the thin line between life and death, right? Mm -hmm. uh, life's meager thread, the string between two worlds divides us, right? Uh, the, um, but the main riff, right, you might hear it first as just the intro, and not be paying much attention, but it's what's happening under the chorus with the heart, with the growls. Mm -hmm. uh, and although it, it has this kind of falling asleep in the sun vibe to it, though it's a really elaborate, uh, keening kind of, uh, sad my dying it's like a my dying bride riff, right? Well, yeah, and right. it's it's got that really spicy sort of key change at the end of the riff thing which i find fascinating texturally yes the spidey the spicy catatonia chord change yeah yeah change, i really totally like that directs the melody yeah it's super super cool um yeah so it's actually that is a great riff it's just not being foregrounded and it's something a little bit different from what we might expect from this band which is like uh, not just a slow death metal riff, but an actual doom riff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that has the characteristic rhythm and tempo that you could trace back to Candle Mass or to, you know, uh, um, any of the, you know, the British doom bands. So uh, there's more going on there than meets the eye, but also the point is that when you put that back to back with another one, like the Fire at First Dawn, it's really just this like expansive nine a minute stretch of sprawling indulgence and it's kind of the point yeah this record is meant i think it's meant to be listened to uh as especially atmospheric music and there's an interest in hyper continuity that actually means songwriting wise it's much closer to the dsbm records we're reviewing before and after this than one might think mm-hmm yeah, it's um, I I just I, I like these tracks on this record just as a way to break up the really focused pop metal songs. You know, I, I like having something a little bit more broad and atmospheric and texturally focused. You know, it, it prevents you from getting a little too acclimated to the hook driven nature of the other material. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think just the important thing for people to realize is that there are a lot of tracks like that on here. Uh, mm -hmm. The Journey, even though it's a bit Bathory, is much more like that. I think The Stolen Fire is, uh, um, you know, they're, they're much more... Um, the, Resol the Resolute is sort of epic, but much more in this uh, big wash of sound way. Um and, and, and that those sorts of moments of immersion or drifting are pretty important to how this record works. And you have to expect them and uh, um, sink, sink into them. Yeah. 
Like, this album has a... It, 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 what this album also has is a reductive... It, it's a sort of boiling down of Hanging Garden to certain essential phrases in mm-hmm. the riffing and vocals. And often those are sort of like... With an emphasis on the most poppy side of their writing, but like essential poppy hanging garden vocals with these certain kinds of turnarounds or shapes to them. Uh, And because it's deliberately less detailed writing, for the most part, these are not, I would say, the best versions of those melodies I've heard on their records. But what they are is sort of elemental. I think you use that in the notes. Like fundamental versions of these melodies. And they, um, you know, the record is called The Garden, right? So this has to be some sort of distillation of essentials for the band. And and when you hear those... Uh, and, and so if the record is this kind of... These sort of very characteristic but sanded down and homogenized melodies throughout, like the cool kind of reverent... Uh, slow paced but uplifting atmosphere of, of this music will really just really carries through the whole thing um, and you can put it on and listen to it as more of a textural thing that's all I mean no I get you and and it will make you like feel good not <laughs> um, so um, let's go last to the statement track The Garden which is again I think maybe a more concerted version of this big wash of sound approach um and uh, after that, I want to talk a little bit about the lyrics because they're so damn good. But um, uh, yeah, let, let's listen to this one. And instead of starting at the beginning, like we have for most of these tracks, we're going to start um, two and 45 seconds in. So this one's more like a bit more of a, an epic. <laughs> So that was probably one of the most out passages on the record, where you just get all those different interacting sort of bends and effects and textures. I don't know if there's even a better word for it, right? But just those various kinds of strobing, uh, interlacing strobing sounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like those. Yeah, yeah, that's like a very sound object passage. Uh, And there's way more there when you listen to it carefully. You know, if you're listening casually, right, 
this record wants you to be a deconcentrated listener, right? It wants you to not be paying that much attention. And yet that can lead you to underrate it. Because if you listen closely to parts like that, there is a lot of work there. There is a ton of detail in the sound design. Mm. Um, the, uh, um, yeah, I mean, not that much more to say about that passage, except the part where the chugs came in was cool. <laughs> but, uh, um, let's talk about the lyrics. Although it's called The Garden, the record really seems to be about fire. Maybe fire at the heart of the garden. Um, and it seems to be about the tracing the Promethean streak in Northern mythology. Uh, that is written mythemes that roughly parallel the Prometheans, the Prometheus story with, and generally with more of a, you know, Scandinavian or Finnic inflection. Um, and, you know, it's just like, the music reminds you of Lacuna Coil or Nightwish in places, and yet the lyrics, it's just imagine, like, a teenager opening, like, opening, imagine a teenager encountering this record and reading these lyrics, right? They'd just be, like, floored. Yeah, <laughs> they they probably would not find it relatable, right? And these lyrics are also way more depressing in places than any fucking you know teenage goth bargains for, right? <laughs> like, uh, um, uh, so what, what what's what's it? I haven't fully decided on one to read, uh. But I really like, um, here for the Promethean focus, uh, good to do, um, uh, let's see, I mean, yeah, okay, the Stolen Fire is good for this, but I think I'm just going to read some excerpts from various songs, so like, on a Nightwish sounding record, you would not expect someone to write a song from the perspective of a thunderbolt. Right? <laughs> but this is the fire at first dawn. Right? Uh, 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 on the shore, the salty wind, gentle rain, they're calling me, and I fall with them. From heaven's vault, a torrent and a cloud, a firebrand, a storm. From Welkin's shores, a herald heaven born, I fall down. Atia, Taranus, and Tyr, my name. Thunder, Perkunas, fire's sun. On the shore at world's end, searing rain. It falls with me, and I fall with flame. Uh, so that is... Those are black metal lyrics, right? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, so that's a good example of what you were saying about black metal being all around. This is a... I always sort of wondered about the vibe. Like, this music always has sounded pagan-ish to me, but on this record, it's very apparent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it is not... Uh, refreshingly, most of it is not just recitations of myths. It's all been imaginatively and poetically transformed. Uh, the... Um, uh, you know, here on, on The Stolen Fire, we've got like a... You know, something like the god who has stolen fire and brought it to humanity is sort of uh, forgotten, immemorially forgotten, right? Uh, um, my bones are scattered upon the threshold of dusk, guarded by the spirit of dawn. Seated upon black stone, I guard the darkness alone. The stolen fire smothered, forever lost in the dark. On the hill of eternity, I am one with it all. On the hill of eternity, I am alive. My dust is scattered along the bridge of the moon, watched over by the eternal twilight. A breath upon the shore, I guard the darkness alone. My f titan figure drowned in a lethean tide. O oh, my children, those who held aloft my light. O oh, my children, all but gone into the night. They have all but forgotten. And then, one more that's... The, the, the mood on this record is constantly directly confronting the most desolate and, you know, final realities of our life and is constantly coming back from them with a smile on its face uh, and finding and finding affirmation. So you get uh, the fireside. This one's just amazing. This is one you sampled, right? Yeah. Onward through shallow water. 
Hear the spirit call for your safe return, for the tide to bring you home from your journey harsh and long. Come, run through the dark, come and join the dance, dance through the night, dance to the firelight. The spirit invites you to dance, dance through the night, dance to the firelight, through fire, for you are alive, alive.
That's your God talking blinded you with cross. You had me take off my cross because it offended... It offended no one. No, it simply appeared to me to be discourteous to, uh, to wear the symbol of the deity lost in. My ancestors tried to fight to open the door that separates us from our creator. You need no doors to find God. If you believe... Believe? If you believe you are God. Can you look around this world and believe in the goodness of a God who rules it? Famine, pestilence, war, disease, and death. They rule this world. Hope, I assure you. No. If a god of love and life ever did exist, 